The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Myra Brower, council staff, and I'm going to walk you through a presentation on the Vision Blueprint Regulatory Amendment 27, which proposes changes to commercial management measures for the SNAP group of fishery. So the council is taking action um, in response to a Vision Blueprint which they put together a few years ago to address management of the commercial and recreational sectors in this number group of fishery. So the blueprint on the goal objectives, strategies, and four areas, or core areas of science, management, communication, and governance. In 2015, the council prioritized action items that would be addressed through amendments to the SNAP group or FMP over the next five years. They chose to focus on actions that would address seasonality and retention in the fishery and began development of two amendments to address the commercial and recreational sector separately. So this amendment we're talking about right now is for the commercial sector. During the visioning project, um, we met with stakeholders up and down the coast and one of the things they indicated they would like to see action taken um, in the near future was to allow equitable access and to reduce discards in the commercial fishery. So the actions in the amendment that I'm presenting to you today would consider split seasons, trip limits, seasonal closures, and minimum size limit changes for the commercial sector of the Snapper Group of Fishery. So here's a list of the proposed actions in the amendment. There are 10 of them. The first one looks at establishing a split season and modifying the trip limit for blue line tilefish. The second action would establish a commercial split season for snowy grouper. The third action would establish a commercial split season and modify the commercial trip limit for greater amberjack. Action number four looks at establishing a split season and modifying the trip limit for red porgy. Action five modifies the trip limit for vermilion snapper. Action six would implement a minimum size limit for Almaco Jack for the commercial sector. Action seven looks at a commercial trip limit for the other jacks complex, which includes Almaco Jack, Lesser Amber Jack, and Banded Rudderfish. Action eight would modify the seasonal prohibition on commercial harvest and possession of red grouper only off of South Carolina and North Carolina. Action nine would remove the commercial minimum size limits for three deepwater snappers. And finally, action 10 would reduce the commercial minimum size limit for great trigger fish only off of East Florida. So what I'll do now is I'll walk you through action by action and describe what the potential effects are for each of them. Beginning with action one, commercial split season and trip limit for blue line tilefish. Um, right now, the fishing year for this species is the calendar year, and the commercial trip limit is 300 pounds gutted weight. So under alternative two, the council is looking at specifying commercial fishing seasons and allocating the commercial ACL into two quotas, 40% to January through June and 60% July through December. Any remaining quota from season one would transfer to season two, but any remaining quota from season two would not be carried forward. Under that alternative, there are two sub alternatives uh, for trip limits under each season. So for sub alternative 2A, it would be 100 pounds gutted weight in season one and 300 pounds gutted weight in season two. 2B two would look at 150 pounds gutted weight in season one and 300 pounds in season two. And here's what the council's preferred alternative currently is. So they would retain the January, December fishing year, so no commercial split season for this species. Instead, they're looking at modifying the trip limit and implementing a 100 pound gutter weight trip limit from January through April and a 300 pound gutter weight trip limit from May through December. And you can see the other um, sub alternatives that are being considered uh, that have also been analyzed um, under that preferred alternative three. So here I just wanted to show you the average monthly um, commercial landings by state in the upper um, graph there. <clears throat> and it's broken down um, by states and colors, and you can see that North Carolina is where the bulk of the landings uh, for blue line tilefish have been taking place. This is data from 2014 through 2016. Um, I'm sorry, from 2004 through 2013, 
And then uh, since there were in-season closures later in the time series from 2014 through 2016, those years were excluded. On the bottom pane, you can see the percent of annual South Atlantic blue line topfish commercial landings also by state. Um, again, Florida's in the blue, Georgia, South Carolina combined together for confidentiality uh, purposes in the red line and North Carolina in the green. And this table here shows you the predicted um, length under the various proposed alternatives. So in bold, under subalternative 3A, you can see that the 100 pound January through April and 300 pound May through December would likely um, mean a fishery, fishery closure, an in-season closure could happen at the very end of July. Um, and just for reference, um, there's been closures in this fishery since 2013. Um, in June of 2013, um, April of 2015, that's when there was a big change in the ACL. And then um, there was um, a closure in 2016, and then it reopened again for a little while um, at the end of August. The second species um, that the council is considering that um, kind of needs to go hand in hand with blue line tilefish because these two species are caught together in most of the South Atlantic um, area jurisdiction is for snowy grouper. So they're looking again at establishing a split season for snowy grouper. Right now, the fishing year is the calendar year. Again, the same sort of scenario where you have two quotas and you have carryover from season one to season two, but no carryover um, from one fishing year to the next. And here the council's preferred is to allocate the annual catch limit into two quotas. 70% would go to the period between January and June and 30% to the period between July and December. And here are similar graphs to show you the distribution of landings uh, of snowy grouper in the region, but broken down by state and by month. And then on the bottom, um, looking at that percentage. So you can see it's a little bit more, more balanced. There's still a um, good many landings in North Carolina, but then Florida um, also has um, a lot more landings of this species in, for blue line. And here's the table that shows you potential um, season closures under the various alternatives. So under alternative three, which is highlighted on the bottom, you're looking at um, the middle column labeled me. And so we're looking at possibly uh, remaining open during January through June. And there might be a closure at the end of September in the second season, July through December. So moving on for Amberjack, again, they're looking at a commercial split season and changes to the trip limit. So the fishing year for this species is currently from March 1st to the end of February. There's also uh, during April a prohibition on sale and purchase, and the possession limit is one per person per day or one per person per trip, whichever is more restrictive. The trip limit in March um, and from May through the end of February is 1,200 pounds whole weight. Um, so here, the council's preferred is to, again, specify two commercial fishing seasons. Um, it would be split 50-50 um, between March and August and September and February. <clears throat> the um, restrictions during the month of April would remain. And then they have a suite of trip limits to choose from. They've, they've selected 2C as their preferred, which would impose a 1,000-pound trip limit in both seasons. And you can see on your screen the other alternatives that are up for consideration. Uh, under alternative three, the quota would be split 60-40, <coughs> uh, the same six-month seasons, and that alternative also has its own um, suite of potential trip limits. And then alternative four would uh, maintain the restrictions in April, but there would not be a split season there would simply be a change in the trip limit. So the council is looking at a 1,000 pound full weight or 800 pounds um, full weight for amberjack. And here is again, the distribution of the landings. Amberjack are mostly caught in Florida. Um, you can see the month of April is missing from the top graph because of the harvest prohibition during that month. And then the bottom graph shows you the percentage of landings by state. So I apologize, this table is a little bit busy, but you can see if you focus on the bolded portion, um, subalternative 2C, 
is currently the council's preferred. So uh, if you look at the column labeled mean, uh, under a 1,000 pound trip limit from March through August, it is expected that the ACL would be caught by the end of June. And the second uh, season, there is likely not going to be an in-season closure. Um, and so you can see the two, the two scenarios for the different splits of the ACLs. And then at the very bottom under alternative four, without a commercial split season, what those two different trip limits would do um, in terms of how long the season would stay open. For Red Porgy, uh, moving on to action four, the commercial split season um, for this species is meant to address the issue of discards more so than the accessibility like the other actions um, that we just went over. For Red Porgy, the fishing year is from January through December. During January through April, however, um, there is a, sell, a sale and purchase prohibition on Red Porgy. And the position limit is three per person per day or three per trip, whichever is more restrictive. From May through December each year, the trip limit is 120 fish. Um, so under the preferred alternative, which you see on your screen, the council would specify two commercial fishing seasons and allocate the ACL into two quotas. 30% would go to the period January through April and 70% to May through December. And then the council will remove the January through April sale and purchase prohibition and retain the commercial trip limit of 120 fish for the remainder of the year. And then during January through April, they're looking at imposing a trip limit of 60 fish. You can see um, there are other subalternatives that are, have been analyzed uh, for the council to consider Alternative three, uh, the split of the annual catch limit would be different. It would be split 50-50, um, January through April and May through December. Again, maintaining, um, removing the January through April sale and purchase prohibition, maintaining the 120 fish trip limit for May through December, and then considering the same suite of trip limits there, um, 30 to 60 fish. And then under alternative four, the January through April harvest prohibition would be removed and there would be a commercial trip limit of 120 fish um, for the entire year. Here's the distribution of landings for this species um, by month and by state in the top graph. And this is uh, for information from 2005 through 2012 in 2014 through 2016 and then the bottom pane shows you the percentage of annual landings um, again by state and you can see how those lines have converged here in recent years the table showing you um, the potential closures um, for this for the various scenarios considered for red porky so you have the no action at the top and the two um, scenarios with different splits of the commercial annual catch limit. So subalternative 2C is bolded. And um, you can see that during the first uh, January through April season, um, the current, the, the scenario would take land, the harvest through the end, almost the end of April. So it almost remains open the entire time. And then um, for the second season, we're looking at a potential in-season closure at the end of September. Um, so before um, I mentioned that it's important for this species that council is trying to address the issue of discards. Um, commercial discard data currently are collected using a supplemental form that is sent to 20% of the active permit holders randomly. And then uh, from 2014 through 2016, Red Porgy had a very high number of discards. There were 24,754 fish that were reported um, discarded. And so this is pretty high compared to other snapper species. There's also high discards of vermilion and gray triggerfish. And um, those three species are in our region caught um, together uh, frequently. So moving on to vermilion. Action five, um, again here, Chameleon Snapper currently has um, a split season. So the annual catch limit is split 50-50 um, between two six month seasons and the uh, um, same rollover um, allowance between seasons is there, but no rollover from one, one fishing year to the next. 
So for this action, the council has not yet selected a preferred alternative. They're considering and waiting to hear what the public has to say. Alternative two would retain the trip limit and the trip limit reduction or step down in season one. And then for season two, the trip limit would be reduced to 750 pounds and there would not be a step, a step down in season two. Alternative three would retain the trip limit and the trip limit reduction in season one. And then for season two, the trip limit would be reduced to 500 pounds um, better weight without a step down. Alternative four modifies the trip limit for both seasons and removes the trip limit reductions. So the subalternatives there are 1,000 pounds, 850 pounds, and 700 pounds. So this table shows you the predictions for season one. So you can see at the very top, the trip limit uh, is reduced under the no action alternative um, around the beginning of March. And then the fishery shuts down towards the end of March. The trip limit reduction typically only allows another three weeks or so of harvest. Um, so that you, could, you can see at the very bottom, <clears throat> subaltern is 4A through 4C, um, how where that would take the harvest through the end of March or the very beginning of April. For season two, um, the trip limit reduction to alternative one, which is the current um, regulations, typically happens around the end of August. And then the fishery closes um, sometime two or so weeks into September. So you can see what the potential difference in trip limits uh, would do to the harvest. So you're looking at harvest being carried through the end of September to up to the middle of October under a 500 pound trip limit with no reduction. Action six looks at uh, modifying the minimum size limit for Almaco Jack or implementing one, I should say. There currently is no minimum size limit for this species. And they're looking at a, a range of alternatives between 20 inches and 26 inches. Council has selected um, subalternative 2A, 20 inches full length as their preferred. So this table here shows you um, the total landings and uh, potential closure dates um, under a 20 inch minimum size limit. Looking at data from 2014 through 2016, it looks like about 88% of Almaco Jack that are landed commercially by weight in our region are above 20 inches and about 66% of the catch is above 26 inches. So obviously specifying a min minimum size limit uh, for this species that doesn't really reduce the harvest below the ACL and it really wouldn't um, do much for extending the fishing, fishing season. So you see on your screen the ACL for the complex that this species belongs to, which is the other jacks complex, is 189,000 uh, pounds. There have been in-season closures um, every year since 2012, which is when the annual catch limit was first put in place. Um, one thing to note with minimum size limits, sometimes they can result in increased discards, but they can also protect reproductive potential. <clears throat> The other thing the council is looking to do with this group of species is look at establishing a trip limit. There is currently no commercial trip limit for the other jacks complex um, in the South Atlantic region. They're looking at a range between 500 and 300 pounds, and they have selected 500 pounds as their preferred. So here, it show, this table shows you the combination uh, what would happen if you selected a 500 pound trip limit as is the council's preferred and a 20 inch minimum size limit. So you're looking at a potential closure date for this complex of about mid-September. So um, the monthly landings um, looking at this group of species show a clear pattern where um, landings uh, pick up in April, but the fishery is pretty much over by August. Um, there's landings over the rest of the year, but a much lower level. And so the combination of the minimum size limit and the trip limit could extend the season through mid-September. Uh, one of the things that the council set out to do um, initially in the early stages of this amendment was to make modifications to the shallow water grouper closure. 
So currently during January through April, there is a sale and purchase prohibition on shallow water groupers um, harvested from or possessed in the, in the South Atlantic um, federal waters. This group um, includes gag, black grouper, scamp, red grouper, yellowfin grouper, yellow mouth grouper, red hind, rock hind, gracie, and coney. So currently the council is only looking to make changes to the um, closure for red grouper and only off North and South Carolina. There's concerns that red grouper are still in spawning condition when grouper season opens May 1st. And so the council's current preferred is to extend that closure just for red grouper and um, through May. So right now the um, closure only goes through April, so it would just be extended an extra month, um, as I said, just for red grouper. So prior to the closure, um, red grouper landings off the Carolinas um, accounted for about 20% of annual landings in the whole region. So under preferred subalternative 2A, a January through May closure, uh, we're looking at possibly eliminating an additional 12% of annual landings. Um, the current maintaining what is currently in place would uh, minimize complexity because then you wouldn't have a different season just off the Carolinas. But as I said, fishermen have reported red grouper still in spawning condition during May um, off the North Carolina coast. So another thing to note is um, red grouper is not rebuilding um, as expected. That's under red, red groupers overfished and is under a rebuilding plan. And um, in 2016, uh, commercial landings only reached about 15% of the ACL. And they've been pretty low in 2014 and 2015. Uh, an amendment was recently uh, submitted for review that would reduce the total ACL for this species in 2018 um, to 139,000 pounds and 150,000 pounds in 2019. The current ACL is 780,000 pounds. So there's um, some other management changes happening uh, for this species. Moving on to action nine, this action would remove the size limit for certain deep water species. There are three deep water snappers that still have a 12 inch total length minimum size limit. And the idea here is to reduce discard mortality. And so the council is looking at removing that minimum size limit for queen snapper, silk snapper, and black fin snapper. Um, for the data that we looked at from 2014 through 2016, there were only two trips that reported discards of silk snapper, and there were no discards for queen snapper and black fin snapper. So there's going to be very minimal changes in discard or harvest rates um, from this action. But the idea is to curb discard mortality. And then finally, action 10 reduces the minimum size limit for gray triggerfish off of East Florida. The current minimum size limit um, is 14 inches fork length off East Florida and 12 inches um, off the rest of the South Atlantic states. Under the current preferred, the commercial minimum size limit would be reduced back down to 12 inches fork length off East Florida. And this was in response to um, action that was taken back in 2015, um, where both the state and the uh, um, federal waters regulations were changed to impose a 14 inch minimum size limit off Florida. Well, um, off of South Florida, the frequency of um, great trigger fish above 20 inches is very low. So this was creating a lot of discards in that fishery and the state of Florida moved to Im impose a 12 inch minimum size limit um, on great trigger fish earlier this year. So, Lowering the size limit would result, however, in approximately 20% of additional gray trigger fish available for harvest. So landings could increase and result in shorter commercial seasons. Um, a decrease in the minimum size limit sometimes also can affect reproductive potential, potential as you know, larger fish are going to produce more eggs. And however, lowering the minimum size limit, as I mentioned, would bring about consistency with other regulations um, in our region. And I should mention that <clears throat> recent research um, suggests that re release mortality of gray trigger fish may be higher than what was previously thought. Um, the latest stock assessment estimated release mortality of 12 and a half, 12 and a half percent for gray trigger fish. So that is, in a nutshell, what the council is considering in this amendment, that we are um, taking comments. 
There are several ways you can comment. You can submit written comments using the online form that's available on the Council's website from the Public Hearings and Scoping Meetings page. Those comments um, are immediately posted to the website and, and the Council members and the public can view them. Written comments must be received by 5 p.m. on May the 11th. If you wish to mail in your comments, you can do so at the address on the screen. You can also send them by fax. And we're going to be posting these presentations, uh, a public summary document, and the draft amendment um, online. We are also going to be conducting more public hearings. Um, there's going to be uh, webinars and then listening stations throughout. You can see the dates on your screen. And at those listening stations, council members will be present to um, take your comments, and those will become part of the record. So thank you for listening.